Well, good afternoon to you all and to those watching online. As Pro Vice Chancellor for University Community and Engagement, I'm delighted to welcome you to this remarkable gathering, 50 years and counting, a conversation between Henry Louis Gates Jr. or Skip <laughs> and Anthony Apia, Woli Soenka, and moderated, of course, by Gillian Ted. We feel very fortunate to host this convergence of three compelling speakers and extraordinary people who also happen to be very old friends, a friendship that actually started here in Cambridge 50 years ago. Now in the year two, uh, 2022, Cambridge has the privilege, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Cambridge has the privilege of awarding them all honorary degrees. This conversation is a rare opportunity to gain insight into the long and influential friendship spanning 50 years of dramatic personal and societal change. Our three speakers have been pivotal to each other's development as academics, as eminent thinkers, and as people. I'm sure we can expect something captivating. In fact, we can almost guarantee something captivating and thought-provoking reflections, anecdotes, and life stories. They need no introduction, but just in case you somehow missed what happened over the past 50 years, I'll just say a few words. <laughs> Professor Woli Soenka is a writer and Nobel laureate in literature. After studying in Nigeria and the UK and spending time as a dramaturg at the Royal Court Theatre, he directed two theatre companies in Nigeria. He's best known as a playwright, but his works also include poetry, novels, and essays. He has held professorships all over the world and is an honorary fellow at Churchill College, Cambridge. Professor Kwame Anthony Apia is a leading academic in literary and cultural studies with a focus on African and uh, African American culture. Following an undergraduate degree in philosophy at Clare College, Cambridge, where he later returned for a PhD, he has held chairs at Harvard, Princeton, NYU, and at the University of Ghana. He's an honorary fellow at Clare College and has recently been appointed president of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. In 2016, he delivered the Reith Lectures. Skip is the Alphonse Fletcher University professor and director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. He was the first African American to be awarded a Paul Mellon Fellowship he studied for a PhD in English literature, also at Clare College, Cambridge, of which he's an honorary fellow. Alongside his wide-ranging prof professorial career, he's an Emmy and Peabody Award-winning filmmaker, literary scholar, journalist, cultural critic, and institution builder. And finally, our moderator, Gillian Tett, is chair of the editorial board and US editor at large at the Financial Times. Many of you, I'm sure, read her columns Averly and her books. She also founded Moral Money, the FT sustainability platform. In 2014, she was named columnist of the year in the British Press Awards, having earlier won journalist of the year. She has a PhD in cultural anthropology from Cambridge University. Please join me in welcoming all of them, and then Gillian, over to you to get us started. <laughs> Well, thank you very much indeed, and greetings to all of you, both of you who are in the hall and also those of you who are watching online. I am absolutely thrilled to be here today because it really is a historic moment. Yesterday, oops, doesn't sound like this is working very well. Um, yesterday, we had three prominent black intellectuals receive honorary degrees for the first time together in a truly wonderful ceremony. And we now have the three of you sitting on stage to talk about your experience at Cambridge, which again, as I understand, has rarely been done before here in Cambridge in this way. And coming from the media, coming from the world of anthropology, I know that stories matter. The way we tell our histories, we, the way we present images, really, really carry messages, not just to ourselves, but to the next generation as well. 
And certainly we at the Financial Times have become very conscious in recent years of the degree to which the pictures of people who wield power in the pages of the FT tend to be overwhelmingly white. Many universities, including Cambridge, are aware of that as well too, and are keen to not just correct the record, but present inspiring stories for the next generation of students and others. So it's fantastic to have the three of you here today. Um, and what we're going to try and do is talk a bit about your memories of what brought the three of you together in Cambridge 50 years ago, and it was indeed 50 years, um, how you think the world has or has not changed, and what needs to happen next. Um, so maybe I can start with you, Skip. Okay. Um, as somebody who has spent much of your career um, working to champion African-American voices, histories, presence in educational establishments, tell us, first of all, what brought you to Cambridge in 1973 and how did you meet these two and become such good friends? Well, when I was growing up, <clears throat> I wanted to go to Harvard or Yale and then to Oxford or Cambridge because, quote unquote, smart people went to those schools. And my, fa and my mother told me that I was smart, so I believe <laughs> <laughs> But my father's cousin, a first cousin, had graduated from Harvard in 1949, the year before I was born. So it had a kind of, he and her, and his wife, actually, took a PhD in comparative literature in 1955 from Harvard. So Harvard had a kind of mystique. First. The first, oh, the first African-American woman, um, certainly to get a PhD in comparative literature. But from Harvard, but the second woman overall. So these were magical places. So anyway, by fits and starts, I get into uh, Yale, um, and then I applied for every possible fellowship uh, <laughs> that would take me to Oxbridge. And I was a finalist for all these fellowships, and I failed to get every um, fellowship for which I was a finalist, down to the last one. There was only one left, and that was the Mellon Fellowship. And I went into the interview and um, told them that I didn't know why I wanted to go to, <laughs> didn't know what I wanted to study, but I wanted the experience of living in a predominantly white culture other than the United States, whose relationship to slavery and Jim Crow racism was completely different than that in the United States, to give me an opportunity to discover myself. And I'd spent a gap year between my sophomore and junior year in Africa. And I wanted to have that contrast. And for whatever reason, that um, uh, uh, argument, that motive, which I was inventing right there on the spot. <laughs> Skip is nothing but a good storyteller. <laughs> it, uh, it, it carried the day. And then when I got to uh, Claire, so there are no black people, right, at Claire. 1973 when I came up. But the first person I met, said, what do you want to read here, blah, 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 and then slipped in the conversation. Do you know Anthony Appiah? And I said, no, I didn't, you know, Anthony Appiah. Is that Greek, like the Appian way, maybe? <laughs> so the next day, another person said, oh, um, by the way, have you met Anthony Appiah? So the third day, I was walking through Old Court, and I saw this black man who had a huge amount of hair and a big cowboy hat, <laughs> and I went up to him, and I said, I don't know, anything else about you, but I bet my bottom dollar that your name is Anthony Up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that because... seems like a great moment to ask Anthony, <laughs> how did you end up here? Um, so, chance. I mean, I didn't have any particular... I, I was a medical student when I came here the, this, in 72, and, uh, and my father was of the view that uh, my, when I was sort of one, my father said to a, a journalist who asked what I was going to do, he said, well, if he's going to be a doctor, he'll go to Cambridge, uh, and if he's going to be a philosopher, he'll go to Harvard. So, so I decided I was going to be a doctor, so I applied to Cambridge because my father thought that that's where you should go. And um, then I had to pick a college. So this is my Ghanaian father. Uh, I was, when I was in England, I lived with my English grandmother, and her, she moved from a big house into a smaller house, and the man who bought the big house was a Clare alumnus. And when it came to time for me to visit Cambridge, he said, I'll take you. So we, he drove, we drove across England from Gloucestershire to, uh, to Cambridgeshire, and he introduced me to Sir Eric Ashby, who was the master of Clare, 
And I thought, well, that's as good a reason as any to go to this college. <laughs> then I discovered that it was a, the, going to be uh, in the first round of colleges to admit women. So I thought that was another recommendation for the college. <laughs> uh, I'd been trying to persuade my boarding school to do the same thing. So, um, so but it was very, it was pure good fortune. Right. And was your impression also that it was exclusively white when you arrived? Uh, well, it was a fact. <laughs> 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 well, it wasn't quite exclusively white. There was one Nigerian. That's right. Apart from us, there was one Nigerian, Dapula Dimeji, who was also a philosopher. Um, and I had switched to philosophy in my second year. Uh, but um, you have to remember that I had been to English boarding schools. So I was used to places that were predominantly white. Right. Um, though I should say that when I went, when I arrived at my, um, at my, my public school, my secondary school, uh, there was a Ghanaian head boy. Right. Uh, and he was there because his father had asked my father, had said to my father, I'm sending my son to school in England, where should he go? And he said, well, my, my wife has said that our son is going to go to this school. So, so he got there before me. And so right. it was kind of nice. I arrived with a Ghanaian... Right. Uh, you know, ahead of me and, and all of his siblings. So, Wally, tell us what brought you to Cambridge because you actually ended up supervising Skip, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, it was ironic because I came to Cambridge looking for peace. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was still trying to recover from, um, <laughs> from political detention. Uh, uh, and I was in what I sometimes call my uh, political sabbatical, <laughs> we, we, which is my euphemism, because uh, I hated admitting I was in exile. So I used expressions like, well, I'm going political sabbatical. And uh, I came to London, uh, uh, where I had worked before in the theater, tied to the Royal Court Theater, linked up with one or two people. And uh, to this day, I cannot quite recall how an invitation came from, um, where was Butler, the former uh, Butler, the, poli the states uh, and politics? Trinity. Trinity, it was Trinity, it was Trinity. And I got an invitation. Could I come and see Mr. Butler in Cambridge? Uh, how he heard about me, I have no idea. And in, in, uh, before I got to him, then I got a message also from Churchill College, from the Master of Churchill College. And uh, Butler sounded to me at the time a little bit less formidable than Churchill. <laughs> uh, from the history of colonial history. And uh, I said, okay, let me tackle Churchill first. And so I had a, uh, an invitation. I'm supposed to come for dinner, the usual kind of sizing you up over a glass of wine mm -hmm. kind of interview. And so I went to Churchill. I met the master there. And on the way to Churchill, I was waylaid, literally waylaid, by two uh, dons who said, well, we hear you are honoring an invitation from Churchill. We'd like to suggest that you don't make any commitment until you've seen Mr. Butler, from whom a formal invitation really hadn't come at that time. So I said, all right, uh, no problem at all. So I went to church. I can't remember how that meeting went. And on the way back, these two gentlemen were also waiting, were waiting. And they said, Mr. Butler, I would, wondered if you could drop in for tea. I said, tea, all right, I'd go and take tea. <laughs> and so I went to Mr. Butler, and there he was in his, um, in his study, in this almost medieval, you know, the kind of medieval study with dark, sort of hog, Hogwarts, atmosphere. basically. Yes, <laughs> yeah. you know. And we talked, and he said uh, he felt I could do with a two-year two fellowship at uh, Trinity. I looked at uh, <clears throat> Churchill, reflected I was offered one year, or at least they were content for me to stay just one year, but Mr. Butler said oh, it was a kind of fellowship, a particular fellowship for two years. I said, stay in this medieval castle for two years after <laughs> being in prison for two years. <laughs> was, 
it didn't sound quite right. <laughs> so I went back to uh, Churchill and I said, well, in, although Churchill had done quite a bit of uh, colonial harm to us, <laughs> I think I'm safer in Churchill. It's more open, I could always run away. In Trinity, I thought, <laughs> once I got in there, I could never get out of <laughs> I think it really was Hogwarts, yes. Um, <laughs> so now, fairly soon after that, um, I believe that Skip knocked on your door and more or less announced that you were going to supervise him. <laughs> Is that correct? Skip. Um, well, I didn't know what I wanted to read. So I was pre-med. I was raised to be a doctor. And I was, uh, I'd wanted to go to Oxford to do PPP not PPE, which was psychology, um, physiology, and philosophy. and philosophy. And I was going to satisfy my pre-med requirements and go back, but I didn't get a Rhodes Scholarship. So I came and I decided that I would do side supervisions in the sciences, in chemistry, biology, and physics. And, but I would read as um, an affiliated student, get a second BA. And I, my short list was history of art. Because I'd been to Africa when I was 19, and I'd started collecting African art when I was 19, uh, or philosophy, or English, because I, I love to read. So when I looked at the, the um, course requirements for the tripos of the history of art, it basically stopped chronologically with Titian and the Renaissance. <laughs> as far as I was concerned, that was the wrong Renaissance. Because <laughs> I was interested in the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe the timing might, might be off. I went to see. Tim Smiley, uh, the director of studies in Clare, and Anthony had warned me about that what they called philosophy at Cambridge might be different than what they called it at <laughs> Yale, and he asked me if I'd studied philosophy. And I said, yes, I took a course in ethics, and we started with Aristotle and Plato, and he nodded. And then I said, we did uh, Berkeley and Kierkegaard, and it was, that was okay. And then we rounded it out with Camus and Sartre. And he said, ah, oh, good you should be in the Romance Language Department. Because <laughs> that's not philosophy. Yet. So that left English. And um, when um, I, I decided that I would like to uh, study African literature, if that was possible. And to my amazement, well, they sent me to Jack Goody, who was an, an anthropologist. An anthropologist. I, right? One of my people in my anthropology department, yes. And the year before, 1972, he had published a book, still a classic, called The Myth of the Bagre. Right. And um, I wanted to do supervisions with him. But he said, you know, you're really interested in African literature. There is a Nigerian playwright whom I'd never heard of. In fact, I didn't even know his name. When I saw his name, I thought it was Polish, Wol Swowika. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wrote to Wol Swowika <laughs> and asked if he would uh, see me. And I had a two foot high Afro. You know Cornell West Afro, ladies and gentlemen? Cornell West Afro looked like a crew cut next to my Afro. I wore my best dashiki. And then on the way from Clare to Churchill, I memorized there was a man called Jan Heinz Jan, who had published this grand synthetic work when he claimed, you know, there are 1,500 languages in Africa. He claimed that he had reduced all African cultures to these seven principles called Muntu. So there was Muntu, Huntu, Nuntu, whatever. So on the way over, I was memorizing Muntu, <laughs> everything. And I'd been to Africa, so I thought that stood me in good stead. So, and I wore uh, bright blue sunglasses and teased my Afro out. And so I, I knocked on Professor Shoyinka's door, and when he opened it, he jumped out. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, maybe I should take these sunglasses off. <laughs> and so we chatted a little bit, and I said I'd been to Africa. In fact, I'd been to Nigeria. I'd hitched across, uh, across the equator. Uh, blah, 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 but I didn't know anything about African literature and mythology. Would you be kind enough to supervise me? And he said, well, yes, um, I will. But the real reason that I'm, uh, I have agreed to supervise you is because you were the only African-American I've met who did not uh, try to recite that Muntu rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, not to miss a beat, I said, Muntu, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> so I'm curious because, well, well, one of the things that um, marked out your time here is that, as I understand it, you were actually in the anthropology department, not the literature department. Yes. For reasons which, frankly, today look absolutely outrageous. 
Do you want to explain briefly why you were in anthropology, not in literature? Yeah, when I uh, realized, that was the first uh, uh, moment when I said, did I make a mistake? Uh, maybe I should have gone to Trinity, but then you never knew in what department they would have locked me up. Maybe, <laughs> maybe in archaeology or something. <laughs> but when I got there, and I was supposed to, I was a fellow, I was supposed to teach, and the agreement I thought was to teach literature, and of course with emphasis on uh, African literature. Right? Uh, my sp specialization was also was English literature. And uh, uh, it was a kind of quizzical exchange, I remember, when, in the faculty room where we talked. And, and how the conversation went, I cannot quite remember, but it ended up with my being sent uh, to see the head of anthropology. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered that, uh, yes, they didn't mind one talking about African literature, but only as an anthropological phenomenon. And that's how I ended up in the Department of Anthropology, teaching a kind of social anthropology, uh, seminars. Uh, the, the idea really being strange. basically that literature was essentially Western literature. Mm -hmm. um, and they just didn't accept that there was any Af such creature as African literature. Mm -hmm. And that it was as simple as that in when did Cambridge you, when at did the you time. Write and that was in the yeah. 1970s, hmm? which what is. What year did you write lit literature in Africa? Do you remember? Well, those were the lectures he gave so that's what you that did. year. So those were the, so good. So there's some wonderful lit. Uh, yeah. You haven't yeah. read them. We're talking oh, about 1972, when I came. When 73. Came? 73. 73. So 1973, African literature was seen as a branch of cultural anthropology. anthropology that's right. Precisely. Not proper literature. Not spot Unlike even right. Leeds, where I studied, where we had Commonwealth literature, yes. and African literature was part of all of that. But here, at the time, it was anthropology. So when did that change? I mean, because I'm curious, I'm going to come to you, Anthony, in a moment, but when did, when did it become clear that it was absolutely outrageous to put African literature into a bucket by itself? Well, I'm tempted to say, the day Wally Schenker got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> 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 no, I think the Enlightenment began a little bit before it, that. It, I, I, it, it gradually crept on. I introduced books, literature, uh, works right. that, which had not been heard of before. And I think even while I was here, the, uh, anyway, by the time kind of uh, Satori was taking place, I was already making my plans to retreat completely from Cambridge at right. that time. In 1976, he collected the lectures that he gave here um, under the title Myth, Literature, and the African Worldview, which Cambridge University Press published. And on page one, he says he had one student at the University of Cambridge who studied with him in, through social anthropology. And he sort of denounced the whole thing. And I think that was <laughs> certainly a wake-up call to the the faculty of Right. And I just want to say about that book, it is, it's a wonderful book, and it's actually a talk about that book that got me my first job. <laughs> so, oh, right. So I gave a talk at Yale about myth literature in the African mm -hmm. world, and they gave me a job. So I'm very grateful to you for the... <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, I mean, in the 1970s, aside from the shameful nature of the way that African literature was defined, did you encounter much prejudice, racism? Did you feel like you were out, a fish out of water? Or did you feel accepted? Well, I was told that I could not write. Um, um, I, I was an affiliated student, as I said, in English. But because of these two, I'm, um, they t took me uh, to an Indian restaurant, got me th thoroughly uh, inebriated drinking <laughs> wine. He's quite a. Uh, uh, yeah. what, what? <laughs> Actually, the Chevalier I think... of the Commanderie des Vins. That's right. <laughs> Actually, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think finally your thesis, the uh, title of your thesis was accepted only because we managed to phrase it in uh, mythopoetic terms, to something mythopoetic. So I think it was then... It was because yeah. I was told I couldn't write about African literature. Yes. You know. But I could write about... <laughs> European reactions to the first black writers in the Enlightenment, Something like Phyllis it. Wheatley. And we saw the first, uh, uh, a copy of the first edition of Phyllis Wheatley's uh, book of poetry 
published in September 1773 here in London, in a, a marvelous lunch at the University of, uh, li Library uh, today. And that was, and, but uh, whether or not uh, Africans, this sounds like uh, an exaggeration, it sounds hyperbolic, but whether or not Africans were truly human in the same way the Europeans were was a matter of great dispute mm. throughout, not in Africa, of course, but throughout <laughs> Europe. And the absence of presence of literature, and more specifically poetry, was used. This, I knew nothing about this when I uh, stepped foot in Old Court. And, but that's what eventually uh, I figured out. And I wrote my thesis about the responses to the first Africans, Phyllis Wheatley, Sancho, Equiano, by Europeans as various as Hegel, Kant, um, Hume, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Abbe Grégoire. So yeah, the definition of whether or not Africans were deemed to be human right. was really made according to whether they had literature or not. Sure, if they could which, produce literature. If they could produce literature, which right. of course was a ridiculous um, because break test. Because after Descartes, I think, therefore I am, who's a human being? A person who possesses reason. How do you know reason? You know it through its writing. But the valorization of poetry, particularly in the 17th and 18th century, had al already occurred. So Voltaire writes a letter to his friend and says, Fontenelle was wrong. Africans can write poetry because he read Phyllis Wheatley's book. But on the other hand, Thomas Jefferson uh, read it and in his notes on the state of Virginia said, the poetry published under her name, <laughs> suggesting that she hadn't really written it, or was beneath the dignity of criticism. Wow. So I traced this discourse and that was my just Right. I mean, Anthony, did you encounter much um, prejudice, racism? Um, so I don't think I... I mean, maybe I did. I wasn't aware of it. Uh, I mean, as I say, I, you know, I have an English mother. I grew up uh, going to English schools. Um, and I, I, I think it's true, and Skip is, was the first person to point it out to me, that, um, that there were enormous protections uh, for dealing with racism from, from the class position of my English family. So, you know. My grandfather was Chancellor of the Exchequer. My great grandfather was the first Labour, Labour leader of the House of Lords. Um, had two great, 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 great grandfathers in the Reform Parliament of 1832. <laughs> so, uh, so if people sort of treated me badly on account of my skin colour, I mostly thought it was their problem mm. um, uh, because I was uh, usually condescending to them on class grants, but, um, <laughs> so, but so, I mean, I'm sure there were things that happened that had to do with not being white. I, I know they, they were, but honestly, uh, you know, I had a circle of friends. I had, I, I knew black people. Uh, I knew all the black people. Uh, <laughs> all both. All both. <laughs> but I had a circle of friends. You know, I had people I'd known in uh, at prep school. So, so, and they didn't. You know, I, the schools I went to, as I say, there was a Ghanaian head boy when I was um, mm. first arrived. I don't mean there was no racism in school. There probably was, but it didn't really. So, so I think I sort of came at this at a very odd slant. Right. Uh, so I don't want to say, I mean, just let's be clear, the fact that you couldn't study uh, African uh, fiction or, or drama or poetry in the English department, uh, stuff written in English, uh, is a evidence of racism in my view. Uh, so I'm not saying everything was perfect, but I, it didn't honestly. Right. I mean, what, in fact, for me, there was a sort of the opposite thing, which was because there were so few black people, it created an immediate um, connection mm -hmm. with people. I, I, you know, if I, if Skip had been white and from West Virginia, I probably would have never met him, mm. uh, and we would not have known our friend Ronnie Matebi. Right. Yeah. Uh, who is the Kabaka? Who is the Kabaka of Uganda? Right. So, <laughs> I think my generation came on the cusp of a certain transition. You call it the transition between uh, uh, class and actual race. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, is that as a student, I'm now going back a little bit. As a student, At least. Uh, I found that students uh, were treated like uh, exotic creature, an exotic class in themselves. They were usually princes. Mm -hmm. And uh, some pretend, of them hammed it up to be. as princes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But the transition came with the influx of the Jamaican, what I call the West Indian armada yeah. of cheap labor, mm -hmm. 
when those boats began to arrive from mm -hmm. uh, the West Indies, mostly Jamaica, mm -hmm. uh, and they were obviously the working class. They came as cheap labor. Mm -hmm. And that was when our stock fell from princes to laborers. <laughs> <laughs> And even some, um, some of our own people, Nigerians from West Africans, absorbed this. Mm. And so to the, that's what uh, Anthony's uh, statement becomes very interesting, because it was echoed in this, during this particular yeah. period, mm -hmm. in which students themselves now saw themselves as a class and almost a race apart from the uh, working class blacks, especially the Jamaicans. Mm -hmm. It's only when the race riots began, mm -hmm. and I used to come down from Leeds Nottingham. and stay in London, mm -hmm. it was then that I think many West African students found that their best bet was to be on the side of the Jamaicans. <laughs> because <laughs> Jamaicans did not accept retreat when they encountered Enoch Powell and his, mm -hmm. his gang of, um, of racist. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, beat us up and the teddy boys and yeah, so on. Right. And that is when the gap closed. So you began to get a sense of something. black identity in definition, in opposition. Yes, to, and uh, we then sort of, some of the class distinction, the prince distinction, then sort of sheared off onto even the <laughs> general. It's so a very fascinating period for me, especially. I mean, this echoes something that uh, W.B. Du Bois wrote about when he was in Berlin in mm -hmm. the late 19th century. And Skip's great hero. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, and I've written a book about him too. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm not going to set up. But, say but, you have a competition, and, both of your heroes. No, 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 no. Yes. But, but uh, um, if you were a student at the University of Berlin in the 1890s, you were a member of, the, of what they called the Bildungsbürgertum, the, mm -hmm. the educated bourgeoisie, and it didn't matter what you looked like. And for Du Bois, this was his first experience of a society in which his color mattered less than his mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was very grateful to the Germans. I mean, he was criti critical later on of German anti-Semitism and so on. I don't mean he, he was un uh, uncritical. Uh, but he, he, the thing that he experienced for the first time there was that sense that, okay, um, you know, I'm here because I'm a, I'm a smart person and I can, and if I, if I do well intellectually, they'll, they'll take me. Right. But I, I became an American here. You became an American not, here? I was not treated as, an, we, at, then, at that time we would have said Afro-American. People said, oh, you Americans are all the same. And I'd say, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it, but so people thing, saw you as American first rather than defining you as black without and white. A doubt. Yes. And, um, Which of course even, would not happen in America. In the yeah. gap year I spent between my sophomore and junior years, in Tanzania and then hitching, hitchhiking across the equator. The um, Africans uh, call me an Mzungu in Swahili in Tanzania, which is the same word used for Europeans. Because I was, a, means wanderer, stranger, et cetera, et cetera. But I was in that class and I would say, no, no, I'm, you know, no, I'm not a Mzungu. <laughs> like you, you, you know. <laughs> well, it illustrates a point which, you know, is core to anthropology, which is everyone thinks that their identity is fixed and obvious and natural and inevitable like gravity. And in fact, it never is. No. It's slippery, it changes in subtle ways, which is both good and very, very bad sometimes. But um, I'm curious, I'd like to ask any of you who want to comment, maybe skip first, how do you assess the change in the environment around race in education in recent years. Because, you know, when you came in, you were breaking the mold in many ways. Um, you were in a clear minority. Um, now, of course, particularly in America, but not just in America, racial issues are convulsing higher education. Critical race theory is, you know, sparking endless debate. Do you think that there's been progress or has it actually been um, you know, deterioration in some ways in terms of the way that the racial issues are looked at today? Well, let's start with the dramatic changes that have occurred at the University of Cambridge in the last four years under the leadership of the Vice Chancellor, <laughs> Stephen Toop. Everybody here give it up for Stephen Toop. Yeah. The fact that we're on this stage is visible evidence of the transformation uh, in race relations uh, at 
Cambridge at one symbolic level, but the, uh, the one-year uh, program that you just instituted that brings people here so they can prepare um, to be um, fully enrolled. I'm, I'm not doing justice to this, and I can't remember what it's called. It's quite revolutionary. Um, and uh, the establishment in Queens, um, Alexander Crummel Fund, Alexander Crummel is the first black person, African American, to matriculate at the University of Cambridge. He graduated in 1853. Um, I spent a wonderful day with a master. They're, and their fund, um, which uh, is, um, uh, funds uh, graduate students um, of color, is 1.62 million pounds, which is extraordinary. And it's specifically for uh, people of color to, uh, to come here. And spe specifically, I believe, in STEM subjects in, in, in the sciences, but probably um, more broadly, and then we've established the Alexander Crummel um, Prize, which honors, uh, uh, and also the Gloria Carpenter Prize, yes. the first woman who matriculated here. These things are symbolic, but of enormous, enormous trickle-down, as it were, importance. In the United States, we are, um, I was part of the affirmative action generation when I went to Yale. There were the 96 black kids hit the campus at Yale in September 96 when I got there. Why would I say we were the affirmative action generation? In contrast, six black men graduated uh, from Yale in the class of 66. So this was dismantling historic racist um, quotas. Last year, 18% of the entering freshman class at Harvard um, was, was black. That's amazing. But on the other hand, we're seeing the rollback of the second reconstruction. The, firm, uh, the Supreme Court is about to dismantle Roe v. Wade, um, ending a woman's right to control, make decisions about her body. And shortly after that, it will dismantle um, affirmative action. Yes. And that's um, a nightmare. We are reliving the 1890s when Reconstruction was finally um, buried, and, and most graphically, through the suppression of the right to vote of African American men in the South, when, where 90% of all black people live. And as you well know, all of these Republican state legislatures are um, writing a, a new horrendous voting requirements aimed specifically at cutting down the efficacy, the power of, of the, the African-American voice of, the, of yes. the black vote. And it's terrifying. It certainly is terrifying and, and shameful. But I'm curious, Anthony, you're at NYU. How do you see the racial dynamics um, playing out? Well, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, let's just remember that uh, uh, there has been enormous progress. I mean, uh, when in the United States, when, when, my, when I was a teenager, my parents' marriage was illegal in the state of Virginia. And, and now I know that if you're a student, you think that when I was a teenager, it was a very long time ago. <laughs> but, but as far as I'm concerned, that's something that happened in my lifetime. Mm. And, um, Harvard now has, how many people do you have in African American? In 41 African? professors. 41 professors. When we got there. 41 professors in African American studies. African American right. and African studies. Right. And the largest African language program in, in the, the world. world. Larger than Larger SOAS. Larger than SOAS. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and when we got there, we, we were number two and number three. Mm. And that was in 1991. Uh, 91. So, I mean, that, we shouldn't lose track of the progress. The progress. The, the, and I think um, one reason why there's sort of something terrifying about the legal ch changes and the fact that the, we have a very, very reactionary Supreme Court at the moment mm. is that the university, on the other hand, I think is full of people who would like to do these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, most of the leaders of most of the great universities are our friend Amy Gutman, who's just stopped being uh, president of the University of Pennsylvania, with whom I wrote a book called Color Conscious, is a, is a big believer in... Uh, all kinds of uh, firm faction, not just... And the Drew Faust, the former Faust. president of Harvard, and Larry Bacow, the present president. Mm. Yes. So there is... What's happening is that, um, in a way... I mean, you can see the culture wars, really, as reflecting the fact that, I think, that the, the Republicans know that they've, in a way, lost... They've lost the academy because they're... Right. A lot of what they want to do is so uh, antithetical mm. to what we believe in. They, they, they don't want to be scientific about vaccines <laughs> and, you know, universities. Without the work in universities, we wouldn't have been able to produce 
right. uh, vaccines in, a, in, a, mm -hmm. in an astonishingly short period of time, which have saved uh, tens of millions of lives. So um, that, that's, as it were, our world. And they've sort of lost it because they, are, they don't believe in the, the truth about the past, they don't believe in science, and so on. Now, I, I'm, I don't want to be a sort of um, too... Um, I mean, there, I don't mean that every member, person who votes for the Republican Party doesn't believe in medicine. Yeah. So one shouldn't exaggerate. But, the, but there are these dominant voices on the, on the, in the American right who, the reason why we don't care for them isn't because, it, it's not as it were a political disagreement in the ordinary sense. It's because they don't believe in the values, uh, respect for truth, uh, careful research, and all those things that are at the heart of what universities are right. about. And that means that even quite conservative faculty can really not go along with a lot of this. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, so there's the bastion of, of an alternative picture of the United States mm. and of the world, I mean, in, 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 in the university, I think. Um, and in a way, it's doing what the American founders intended, because right. they wanted the, us to be a society, I'm an American now, uh, with um, many, many centers of authority and power. The whole point of federalism was to make sure that mm -hmm. the federal government didn't get too much power. The whole point of the uh, separation of church and state, that the, the protection of religious groups, was, to th was that Madison thought that um, if you had powerful religious institutions, if the government moved off in a bad direction, there would be an alternative source right. of authority. And the universities are part, part, of, that. part of that. And, and so I think it's very important that we do our job. <laughs> so I'm curious, I mean, because obviously in America there is, you know, a heated debate about church and state, the role of universities, and a huge pushback um, in a terrible way, as Skip has indicated. But coming to Britain at the moment, I mean, you say 18% of Harvard graduates entering now are black, mm -hmm. African-American. The freshman class. A freshman class. Um, Cambridge, as you mentioned, under the vice chancellor, has made great progress in the last few years. I think there were 26 black students in total um, a few years ago. There are now, I think, 130 from memory. Mm -hmm. But even 130 is only 3.5%. Mm -hmm. That is still a long way to go to mm -hmm. get any kind of racial, you know, um, proper representation. So the question is, I've already got two or three questions. Firstly, what do you think needs to be done to get more black students in Cambridge, flourishing, visible, into leadership roles? Um, what does the university need to do? What do we collectively need to do? And then I'd like to ask you what you think the media should, should do. Mm. But um, any thoughts on what needs to happen? Everyone's looking to you, Professor. Mm. Well, it's a, it's a very difficult question because what comes to my mind immediately when you ask a question like, what can we do to get more, um, more black people into institutions and into meaningful disciplines and so on? The first thing that comes to my mind is, what is the African continent doing to uh, ensure that the institutions, the uh, universities, the um, institutes of technology, uh, and so on, are kept at a certain level that they were especially at the beginning of independence, mm. when the reverse traffic was the truth, and we were receiving students from all over the world coming to study in University of Ibadan, in Legon, in Ife, um, even Ahmad Bello, uh, up north where there's political serious insurgency now. But at that time, it was the norm, it was the norm to see some of the most brilliant students coming from overseas to study in those universities. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the issue of racism doesn't <laughs> bother us in, in that department. That's what comes to mind. These ones who, who are completely within the system are best equipped to say why <laughs> they, they, they want more and more um, integrated, which, of course, one assumes a university in, is in fact created to be, it's almost synonymous with that sense of racial, uh, uh, religious, uh, ideological integration. For me, that's the meaning of the university. But what bothers me is why there should be such an exodus, such desperate exodus going on in this direction at this time. 
mm -hmm. what African governments are doing to restore the university system to what they were just immediately after independence. Yeah. That's a very, very good point. I must say, having spoken to a number of anthropologists who work in Africa, they're very frustrated that there's so little investment and in research into building up African universities and center of excellences themselves. But mm -hmm. Anthony, do you have a view on what needs to be done? I mean, I, I do think that thinking about um, <coughs> making a university like this more genuinely representative of just, I mean, ideally, we're, the university is a, is a global institution, so you should reflect the character of the human world. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I think that in a place like this, with a history like this, part of the challenge is that you can't really think about that kind of, as it were, cosmopolitan diversity without thinking about the challenge of, um, of, of class uh, in, in, the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, which uh, keeps not just uh, many uh, people of color out, but it keeps out a lot of uh, very talented mm -hmm. uh, white people because the codes that you have to master are taught and um, hoarded mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in institutions that are overwhelmingly upper middle class and white. Privileged. Privileged. Yes. Mm -hmm. People are privileged. I, mention my privilege uh, in part to say that I think that, um, you know, we, we can't disentangle racial issues uh, from these issues of, uh, of privilege. If you, uh, I had, we were walking back a couple of nights ago with one of my nephews who went to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, After Eton. Yes, <laughs> he went to Eton, so of course, uh, he's a Nigerian, but, um, it's not too surprising that um, he, he got into his uh, college. And I asked him how many other black people there were at Christ. So he's my nephew, so he's younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and this, so he was here, what, 18, 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. And I said, how many, non how many black people were there in Christ when you were here? He said, I think three, he said. But he said, but one was Filipino. Now, <laughs> so that means there were three people of colour, uh, you know, long after we, we were here. When so, there were three of us. When there were three of us. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, but, and the point is, uh, when there were three of us, I mean, uh, Dapo went to an English boarding school, right? Yes, he did. So, so Dapo was an, an uh, upper yeah. middle class Nigerian. Uh, I'm, I'm an upper middle class um, anglo Ghanaian. And I went to an American boarding school called Yale. Yes. <laughs> I mean, he comes from, in, I mean, he comes, like all of us, uh, and Wally's written about this in relation to his own family, probably the greatest privilege that we all have is that we have wonderful families. We mm. came from, he came from amazing parents who he's written about. Uh, Skip has written about his amazing parents. Um, yeah. And I think that, um, you know, you, one thing you have to do when you, when you, if you really want to make an institution open to everybody is to figure out which of the things that you're doing are in fact just picking up on codes that belong to one particular kind of person. Um, when, 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 I mean, Yale took women at about the same time as... Exactly the same year as it led in black yeah. people. Yeah. In I Britain. must say, I'm, I'm very reminded of, I mean, Darren Walker, the wonderful African-American who runs the Ford Foundation in New York, has written a wonderful book basically on privilege yes, right. and about the fact that if you're going to start to fight for any type of racial um, justice or any type of equity, social justice, the first step is for everybody, whatever colour you are, whatever background, to acknowledge your privilege, mm -hmm. to accept it, not to run away from it, mm -hmm. and to basically then try and work through that. Mm. Um, we, 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 yeah, I'm sorry. I, was say, we talked, uh, I talked at lunch yesterday or day before in Corpus with a young man who I think is the elected student, one of the elected student presidents, and he was saying that uh, for him, one of the great challenges of talking to his peers is that so few of them recognize what, what the tricks were that got them here. They just think they worked hard. Mm -hmm. And they did work hard, I'm sure. But lots of other people were working hard too, and they didn't get here. Well, that's a fallacy of meritocracy, isn't it? Yes, um, it is. As but what Yale did was to have us this, this uh, the new cohort, unprecedented, num unprecedented number of black 
Yale. It was in the late affirmative 60s. action era in the 90, late 1960s. Right. Um, yes. And there were super people. Um, Sheila Jackson Lee was in my class. She's the uh, congresswoman from Houston. Kurt Schmoke, the first black mayor of Baltimore. Ben Carson, who first person. Uh, I saw that little. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, For those of you who don't follow Trump in politics, Ben Carson was part of tr Team Trump, so but may not was, be, you know. It, the was. first surgeon successfully separate yeah. Siamese twins and joined uh, that brain. Yeah. Um, but the But my, my barber, the guys in the black barber shop in Cambridge say, they call me Doc, and he goes, Doc, you were friends with Ben Carson? I said, yeah, back in the day we went to college. They say, that's before he breathed all that ether, brother. <laughs> 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 but they sent us out. Um, to campaign to schools, to Exeter and Andover, so that's Eton and Bryanston and Winchester, um, to recruit. Right. So that the students could see us and we could say, you know, you could do it too. So I think that the problem is, is, is a problem of the feeder system. Mm -hmm. So we have to improve what public schools in America, right, which are um, not public schools here. State schools. State schools. Yeah. Um, but also, uh, the burden should be put on the um, uh, private schools, state schools. Right. What's Eton? Right. Eton is called a public school. The public schools, you're right. Because, they, because you don't have to be Anglican to go there. Oh, I see. So the burden should be put on these schools to diversify. Right. Cambridge and Oxford don't uh, function in a vacuum. You know, you, you yeah. need to, to get need more, to more people of color. And we need massive school reform. We need to reform the quality of education, the primary, middle school, and high school, not, not um, for everybody, but especially for people of color in the UK and in the United States. Right, well, I have two, we haven't got a lot of time left, but I have two key questions on this point. One is, I know, as a journalist, as I said before, I'm very aware of the importance of storytelling, of pictures. Um, I think my colleague Veronica is somewhere in the audience here from the Financial Times, um, and we've been trying very consciously within the FT to try and think about how we present power. Who do we picture? How, who do we actually photograph? What is the demonstration effect? What advice would you give to the media about ways to contribute to improving equity, racial justice, social justice in this respect. That's my first question. And my other question I'd like to ask on the for the benefit of the students here is what advice you would give, the more important question, to the students. But um, let me maybe start with you, Wally. What, what advice would you give to the media and what advice would you give to these students? Well, <clears throat> you talked about images and I agree with you, everybody must, about the power of images. And I think it's one of the reasons I became uh, involved in one of the many uh, labors, hard labors, which uh, Skip uh, dragged one into. <laughs> no, I, I, some, I feel very sorry for you, you know. I, I, I can escape <laughs> You feel sorry time. for him. <laughs> I'm busy in Africa, and uh, you are permanently here. <laughs> anyway, one of his projects was this marvelous one, which we collaborated, <laughs> the image of the black, and you came, in, you came on board, uh, later, I think, the image of the black man in white... Uh, West Nard. White conception, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think we need a lot more of books, works like this, not just as coffee table works, but as integral part of the educational system of especially European nations. Mm -hmm. And so that the children are brought up right from infancy, literally, of seeing how their forefathers, if you like, divided the world. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to them with the kind of education they received to see if they were right to have divided the world along such racial lines. I refer to this specifically, but of course there are many other uh, um, aspects to this re-education, this re-imaging humanity in general. I think that's a critical issue. And the media in particular also you know, can benefit from that. I think they're not, well, I hope they're not too old to learn, at least those who control the media today. But it has to begin from infancy. That's right. What, mm -hmm. I'll come back and ask you about students in a moment, but Anthony and um, Skip, do you have views on the media or representation or advice for I, students? I mean, here? I think that uh, it's um, uh, there's so many temptations to, well, there's two things. I mean, one is in sort of what we now call the mainstream media, the professional media, as opposed to the circulation of 
uh, images and ideas in the, in the social media uh, by people who are not necessarily professionally trained uh, to think about these things. I think there is, so, to, so take the question of what's happening at the university here. It seems to me a certain amount of the coverage is written by people who seem completely unwilling to do the thinking necessary to understand why and to explain why changing things here is not just woke uh, or not just um, uh, giving advantage to people who don't deserve it and so on, just to, to explain, to understand and then explain uh, why, the, why there's a problem and why the attempts being made to solve it are rational attempts to respond to the problem rather than just having a kind of reflex endorsement of uh, reactionary uh, objections to anything that looks like change. So, and th th that requires a kind of uh, thoughtful, deep journalism, because first you have to figure out what the story really is, as opposed to the story you're being told by the people who are telling you it's all right. terrible. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy just to go with the, the, the sort of, in a way the, the other story is sort of, it's a good story, it's, it's not true, but it's a good right. story, and it's, people are going to want to read it. And to the extent that it endorses pre uh, prejudices that people already have, it'll sell your, it'll sell your paper. Mm. So, right. so I think it's, it's, there's an enormous responsibility here, which I think, um, I, I don't mean to say that I, I don't have a kind of uh, rose-tinted view of, of journalism in the past, but it does seem to me that there's a kind of journalism going on at the moment, which has always gone on, but it seems to have more influence at the moment which lacks that sense of responsibility, that sense mm -hmm. that you, you, you shouldn't right. just respond to the prejudices. You should think, what's really going on here? And can I explain to the reader why this, what's going on works, right. well, you know, what makes sense? You, you didn't read journalism at the Clare College. You read socio-anthropology, and you were one of the world's great journalists. You can, uh, the Financial Times could approach the, the marvelous, dynamic black care tab society here and offer um, summer internships, mm -hmm. right? So that you can- That is something actually we're trying to do right now. We're right. actually very actively trying to- You could plant the interns. idea. And if there are any interns, any would-be interns in the hall who want to have a career in journalism, <laughs> <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't all people. put your hand up at once, but yes. But I mean, actually quite seriously, we are seriously overhauling how we do things in terms of our internship pipes. Because so, that's um, how it's done. Yeah. Um, you have to diversify. The way to diversify the content of Financial Times is to diversify <laughs> the people making decisions about the content of the Financial Times. Absolutely. And the only way to do that is a, it's a pipeline problem. Well, I hope Veronica is here because it's over to you, Veronica. You can <laughs> talk to lots of people here, but yes. Um, but yes, no, we are definitely trying to do that. Sure, and summer after first year, second year, and you don't have to have any experience, you could learn. Uh, you know, no one's born a journalist. It, it, mm. uh, no one's born anything. You have to learn how to do these things. Yes. So that's what um, I would do. I also would use the Black Hand Tab Society to recruit broadly um, throughout the um, public schools uh, and, and the, the state schools, too, to increase the number of people who can imagine themselves at Oxbridge. That's key. There are a lot of talented people who just say, oh, I can't do it, or Absolutely. I don't know the codes or their guidance counselor, whatever it's called here, would never even dream of encouraging them to apply here. Well, that needs to change. So, last quick question, because we are over time. You each have one minute to give some wise words. One minute, Skip. One, <laughs> you each have one minute to give some wise words of advice and inspiration to the students here. Ole. One minute. <laughs> Word of inspiration, did you say? Yes, yes. Inspiration. Read, just read, read, <laughs> read a lot, and read outside your immediate discipline. Mm -hmm. Gives you a broad mind. That's, That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. Anthony. Um, well, if I'm talking, uh, am I supposed to be talking to Cambridge students? Well, you can talk to either uh, Cambridge students. Whoever's here, or anybody's here. I mean, um, this is a, a great privilege and to have access to this ancient, uh, creaky, but important institution. <laughs> you know, which is full of people who've done amazing things to get to be the teachers here um, in, in many, many, many fields. And I would take advantage, the best advantage you can of that. But if I may, uh, and this is endorsing really Wally's point, um, not just in whatever it is you're reading, 
I went to almost no philosophy lectures <laughs> when I was a student here. I got a double first in philosophy, but, uh, but I went to lots of other things. <laughs> and what one, one trouble, what one difference between the system that we teach in and the system here is that you're very, very specialized, very, very young. I was very, very specialized, very young. Mm -hmm. um, in our system, we believe in, in a liberal education, which means that you go on studying science and uh, humanities and social sciences uh, at college, uh, and you don't think of yourself as, as if we're completed in your education in any of the broad areas of knowledge uh, by finishing right. high school. So, but you are surrounded by, I mean, one of the great things about the college is that the, the, the person in the next uh, room is not in your subject. Mm. The person in the next room is, in my case, uh, was, a, was an American, actually, my first year, was an American uh, right. who, who was a wonderful viola player mm -hmm. um, and went back to be a lawyer in, in New York. Um, so I think it's really important to take advantage of the place. The, the, there are Go wonderful for. faculty here, but the great thing that Cambridge can give you is each other. So go forth and roam. I was raised uh, by my mother to be a medical doctor and raised by my father uh, to be a lawyer. And it took this a lot to uh, uh, <laughs> reveal to me that all along I wanted to be what we used to call a man of letters, that I really wanted to be paid to read and, and write books and be surrounded by brilliant students the rest of my life. And I had to come 3,000 miles to, ha to have that revelation. You should pick a career, not because you're mom wants you to do it, not because you promised your father that you were going to be an engineer or a, or a doctor, but because it is a, you want to pursue a subject that you love. And I always tell my students, imagine you're 40 years old, um, your wife has just told you, or husband, um, that they're going to leave you, your children covered with acne hate your guts, what is going to make you get out of bed? What is going to uh, turn you on, you know? How can you, what is, uh, what is the subject that will allow you to follow your heart for the rest of your days, even um, when you're going through crises? That is what you should read at the University of Cambridge. Right, so the guess the message really is, go forth and roam, go forth and have the courage of your convictions, and if you're very lucky, and have big dreams, in 50 years' time, you too may get an honorary degree. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all very much indeed. Brilliant. Thank you. 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 So we... <laughs> Thanks, madam. Home run.